we're on a threshold. Last week, we made the decision, unanimous decision, to say, yes, we're going to purchase the property down there. Uh, it was quite an open discussion for those of you who were here. Uh, and I, I apologize. Some of you didn't catch what I said last week. Anyone was invited to attend. It was just that only members were allowed to vote, but anyone was welcome to attend, and that's really important because we're, we want you all to be a part of this. Uh, we got some good counsel last week, and then the fact is, is that after voting unanimously, that really wasn't the hard decision. The hard decision is, God, where are you going to get the money from? $220,000 to purchase that corner. Lord! We don't have that kind of money. <laughs> that was commented on even that at the meeting. $66,000 minimum just for a down payment. Okay, who has that amount? Because I need you to write a check today. Okay. <laughs> some, 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 nobody's raising their hand. Lord, how are we going to? It's, it's going to be impossible, isn't it? I mean, this is the kind of thing that we cannot do without God's help. God's going to have to do it. Or stir a few of you to do a little extra, right, Russ? <laughs> there you go. God's going to have to do it. It's going to take a, an act of the Lord in order for us to purchase that property. <laughs> I guess I should go ahead and tell you that uh, in the last week, there's been two different things, and we now just got a notice of, perf of um, failure to perform. <laughs> we got a notice of failure to perform. The, the seller doesn't really want to sell it to us. <laughs> Yeah, and so don't, don't quote that all around town, but just <laughs> the, the, the seller doesn't really want to sell it to us, and so he's actually trying to get out of, uh, of escrow with us. The problem is he committed to us, and, and really we're offering him the full value of what he asked for, but, but he would like to deal with his um, financial challenges some other way. So, so we get a letter of failure to perform and we have to meet those uh, requirements by the end of the week. Now, at this moment, they're really not that difficult. Um, one of the things is uh, we were supposed to have an appraisal, but now the bank that we've been talking to says we don't need to do an appraisal. So therefore, we don't, we don't have to have that by the end of the week. Uh, there were a couple other things there. They're like, oh, we had, we had to do uh, termite and, uh, and it's a whole construction um, test that you had to do. Well. We, that passed already, but I guess that hasn't been given back to escrow, escrow yet. So there's some items like that, but they, they're giving us a failure to perform. They say, we have to perform by the end of the week, and he's hoping we don't make it. But God wants us to have that corner. And so it's going to happen. And so I want you to continue. Hmm. Excuse me just a second. I want you to continue to pray and listen to God and hear what God's saying to you. By the way, I think that sometimes God even brings people here just like last week when someone was here Sunday just for worship, and guess what they did? They gave us $500 cash. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. Hmm. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yesterday... While we were having our safeguarding children, um, a lady who um, has uh, gone to the coffee company dropped in and handed me a $100 bill. To She's from the community, a $100 bill. God's, God's in this, folks. But, yeah, but it's going to take... Uh, do you want to put that in the offering plate when it comes by? <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> you look scared. <laughs> See, God invites people to be a part of his work. And when he gives that invitation, that's when we come to what's called a crisis of belief. Moses experienced that. Moses experienced that. God calls him to the, to the burning bush and says, okay, look, here, I want you to set my people free. There's the invitation. The invitation is challenging. The invitation is God-sized. It's bigger than what Moses can handle. And now Moses has to decide, am I going to act or not? Am I going to follow through or not? Am I going to believe? It's a crisis of belief. 
Henry Blackaby, who uh, wrote Experiencing God in a, in a book I, just, I recommend to you, it's an encouragement, it's a challenge, and he talks about numerous stories about what God's been doing in life, people's lives. Henry Blackaby shares a story of his own church. He had been talking to his people saying, look, we need to have faith in God. We need to step out of faith. We need to believe that God is acting. We need to prepare and trust Him. And when God calls us to something, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be bigger than us, and we got to do that. So his leaders came to him and said, well, Pastor Blackaby, do you really believe that? Because we've been making a budget for our church for the last several years, and we base that budget on what we have received the, the previous year. So we, that means, Pastor Blackaby, we set our budget not on faith, but on experience. And so, they, so he says, well, you know what? Uh, you've been listening to too many of my sermons. No. <laughs> he said, you know, um, you're, you're right. We need to do something about that. What do you think we should do? They said, we need to ask God what God wants us to do this next year. Establish a budget based on what we believe God wants us to do. Their budget the previous year was $74,000. For, the, for what, they, what they, they met as a leadership and as a church, and they prayed, and they came up with things that they thought God wanted them to do, guess how much the budget was? $164,000. Whoa. Whoa. $74,000 to $164,000. Then came the crisis of belief. Because then the leaders came back to the pastor and said, Pastor, we don't think that we should just set the budget based on that. But we need to spend based on what God wants us to do. Oh, wait a second. Okay, we're more than doubling our budget, and we're going to spend based on what we hope we're going to give? Yes. Even Pastor Blackaby was experiencing the crisis of belief. When God asks you to do something, it's bigger than you expect. It's going to take his resources. But when he's in it, he will help us meet what he wants us to do. Guess how much they made that year? Over $164,000 because they did what God was asking them to do. They needed a building. The church was growing. And the building was going to cost... Now, this is an interesting number. When I saw this this week, I thought, whoa. The cost of, the, of build, redoing their building... $220,000. Anybody hear that number anywhere recently? $220,000. They used people in the church to start doing the building. Halfway through the building process, they, they had no more funds, and they were still $100,000 behind. $100,000 behind. And so they started praying, God, okay. And, and the leadership came to Pastor Blackaby and said, Pastor Blackaby, do you, and they were the, kind of the whole church is looking at him, do, do you really believe that God's in this, that God's called us to do this, that God's going to provide? They actually had a grant that was supposed to come from a foundation in Texas. For some reason, the grant kept getting delayed and getting delayed. All of a sudden, the, the Canadian, this is the church was up in Canada, the Canadian dollar went to the lowest level it had ever, has ever been in history. The lowest level ever. Wouldn't you know it, but that the day that it went to the lowest was the day the foundation funds came through. Ah, now, if you're thinking economically, you understand what just happened. American dollars came when the Canadian dollar was at its lowest level ever. And guess what? The money from the foundation now equaled $60,000 more than they had expected. When God calls us to do something, he calls us to do something that we cannot do in ourselves, in our own abilities. It requires him. It's impossible for us to do. But God provides resources. The question is, what are we going to do then? We are then at the threshold. We're at the, Christ, the point of a crisis of belief. It's the point where we have to then take action. He invites us to join his work. He presents a God-sized assignment, and he wants us to accomplish it. That's what our God does. He says, look... I know you can't handle this. Therefore, I'm going to challenge you to do it. Because in order for you to accomplish what I want you to accomplish, you're going to have to depend upon me and my resources. It's going to take God being a part of it. It's a crisis of belief. A crisis is a turning point. It's a, it's a fork in the road. It's, it's a moment of decision. It, you, you have to decide, are you going to believe God when you're standing there at that place? Are you going to believe God or trust yourself and how you live 
how we live our daily lives is a testimony to our faith in God. Do we trust him or not? That's the threshold that the video was trying to, and I know it was a little hard to hear, right? But I was saying we're all at, th at thresholds. We're all at these points. At this point, at this moment where we're standing there and are we going to move forward? Are we going to trust God? Or are we going to act on our own ability? I also appreciate that Blackaby says that, that the crisis of belief, when we hear God's voice telling us to do something, that, that, that there are really four steps that we face in the crisis. Number one is that an encounter with, an encounter with God requires faith. When God comes to you, God speaks to you, God's talking to you, your response, the requirement is faith. Am I going to believe him? Am I going to trust him? Secondly, he says, encounters with God are God-sized. <laughs> They're bigger than us. Just, just like that corner piece of property. God's encounters with us are bigger than what we can handle in ourselves, in our own ability. Thirdly, he says, what you do in response to God's invitation reveals what you believe about God. The way you respond when God says, this is what I want you to do. And it may be as simple as, I want you to go over and talk to your neighbor, but they're an atheist and they always bark at me and they're mean and I don't like them and they don't like me. And he says, good, that's who I want you to go talk to. <laughs> and what you do in response to that invitation reveals what you believe about God. Because if you say, I'm, I, I can't do it. I don't, know, I don't know how to talk him into believing. I don't know how to deal with his negative thinking. I don't know how to convince him. Notice all the, wor the word I've been using there. That's the da most dangerous word of all, I. God says, look, this is going to reveal what you believe about me, how you respond to my invitation. And third, fourthly, true faith requires action. If you're really going to believe, and James is full of this, Hebrews talks about this, real faith means you got to do something. You don't just say, oh yeah, I believe. Really? Okay, come up here on the communion table, and we're going to have the kids catch you. I didn't believe that much. See, real faith requires action. It's one thing to say you believe, it's another thing to actually believe. Real faith requires action. And our problem really is we're forming a comfort zone. Oh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the diagram that's up there, it shows you the illustration of what we're talking about in these seven realities of experiencing God's presence. Notice, first off, God's at work. God's at work whether you believe it, whether you know it, whether you see it, whether you're involved or not, God's at work all the time. Secondly, God invites us into a love relationship. God loves us so much he wants us to be a part of that personal relationship with him. Thirdly, he then invites us to do something. And that was Paul, uh, Moses where God comes in and then fourthly and speaks to him at the burning bush. Now he has the moment of the crisis of belief. Am I going to leave this bush and do what God said? That will lead him to what? He will have to make adjustments in his life. And that's next week's message. And we're going to probably have to make some adjustments if we're going to be able to, to do what God wants us to do down there on that corner. And then lastly, when you obey, you experience God at work in your life, and that's what we want. But our problem is, I think we form a comfort zone. Christians, and really probably everybody, have a tendency to try to build a life in which faith is unnecessary. Think about it. In which, you know, we don't really need to have any faith. Uh, it, it's a place where everything is in our control. But think about that. That does not please God. When we're in that comfort zone, we're saying, okay, I can handle this. I know how to do this. I'm, I'm taking care of it. I'm, I'm dealing with life on my own. In that place, we are not trusting God. When God speaks, he requires faith. And our major hindrance to obedience is what? Our self-centeredness. Our doing it on our own. Or we think, I can't do that. That's impossible. And looking at them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. Because all things are possible with God. I want you to think about some God-sized assignments that are in the Old Testament and a couple in the New Testament as well. The, the first one is Joshua 6, 1 to 5. We sing the song, right? 
Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, 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 right? And the walls come a-tumbling down. And I say, oh, okay, that's a fun kid's story, right? But what did it take for the children of Israel to go up to Jericho and Joshua tells them, all right, folks, worship team in the front. Oh, that's going to happen more than once, kids. Just warning you. We're worship team in the front. You guys start singing and guess what we're going to do? We are going to walk around Jericho. God, that's a fortified city. We're going to walk around Jericho seven days. Lord, do you have a stomachache? And on the seventh day, we're going to walk around it seven times. And we're going to sing and praise the Lord every day. And the seventh day, we're going to sing and praise the Lord all the way. And at the end of that, we're going to all stop, stand still, and be quiet. That was a miracle. That was a miracle just there. Okay. And then all at the same time, we're going to shout hallelujah and see what God does. Joshua, you know, if this doesn't work, we might want to have an exit plan. Okay, you know, you know, uh, Josh, uh, I, I think uh, we better have the soldiers ready because they're going to be coming over the walls at us. Okay, and, and no, no, no. God's challenged them to do something that's impossible. It's a God-sized opportunity. What happens when they holler? And the walls come a-tumbling down, right? And that God acted on their behalf. Judges 6, 11 through, through 7, 8. The story of Gideon. Don't you love Gideon? He's standing in a wine press hiding. Actually, he's in something other than a wine press. He's trying to crush the grapes because the Midianites keep coming in and stealing all their food and stuff like that. So he's, so he's doing this in secret where the Midianites won't get it. And God comes to him and says, Hey, Gideon! Oh, no. <laughs> what? Gideon, I want, you to, I want you to rescue my people. Do you know who you're talking to? I, I mean, the, the least of all the tribes, the smallest of all the families, and I'm the weakest of them all! Yeah, that's right. I, I, exactly. Gideon, I want you to set my people free. He's going to do the whole fleecing thing like that. And what's going to happen then? He's going to go out and he's going to bring together 32,000 men from across Israel who are going to fight on their behalf. 32,000 untrained soldiers who are going to fight the Midianites who have chariots and iron and steel. And you know, Oh, this is going to be wonderful. Like that, we're going to be going. And God says, good. Thank you, Gideon. Now, take them down to the water have them drink water and, and by the way Gideon we're going to leave here with only what was it 300 men God <laughs> and God has given Gideon a God sized opportunity that only God will be able to accomplish and that's God's goal is to show the people show the world that God is rescuing Israel it's, it's David and Goliath Goliath is out there ridiculing God Almighty. And David goes up and says, okay, God, if my, my God's going to be with me. And we're going to go out there and we're going to take him down. And what does he do? Throws that stone in his head, pulls out his sword, cuts off his, actually kills him first, then cuts off his head and says, look, look what God has just done. But it's not just that day. It's another day with the Philistines. In 1 in, in, um, Chronicles, Chronicles chapter 4, David says to God, God, the Philistines are fighting us. They're, they're going to destroy us. We're really in trouble. And he says, oh, don't worry. You know, we're going to take them down. In fact, I'm, I'm going to kill, take care of them. And, and the story of the Philistines are destroyed. Why? Because God, how? Because God does it. Again, a God-sized assignment. It, it's, I love the story of Elisha. King Aram is coming. And, um, and <laughs> Elisha keeps telling King Hezekiah, he says, hey, by the way, King, um, King Aram's, Aram's coming down the road, so you better not go to this valley. And then don't go to this place. And pretty soon, King Aram gets his leaders together and says, okay, one of you is telling secrets from the White House. No, wrong place. One of you is talking about what's happening in the palace. You've been, you've been getting stories out there, and I want to know who it is. And they say, it's none of us. It's none of us. It's Elisha. He keeps hearing from God, and God keeps telling him what you're going to do. He tells him the stories that you're sharing in your bedroom. And so it's, it's Elijah. Good. Find Elisha for me. And King Aram and all of his soldiers go and surround Elisha's house. Uh, you're kind of outnumbered. It's Elisha and his servant and all these King Aram soldiers. And then 
<laughs> Elisha's servant comes to him and says, uh, Elisha, Elisha, we're in big trouble. There, there's so many soldiers out there. We don't have a chance. We don't have a prayer. And I think it's kind of what he thought. And, and, then, and then I love what Elisha says. He says, oh, 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 don't worry. Because those who are for us are greater than those who are against us. And he, makes, he prays a very simple prayer. He says, Lord, let my servant see what he cannot see. And he sees these soldiers, and they put them to sleep and blind them, and they take them right into Samaria. And, and It's an amazing story of what God does, that God gives God-sized assignments. It, it's, what, it's what he did for Peter even, isn't it? You remember? Here's, here's one. What, what is it we say that it's guaranteed? Death and taxes, right? Everyone, death and taxes. Remember when Peter got this bill? He says, and they, you need to pay taxes. And what does Jesus say? Okay, well, let, let's take care of the tax, taxes. And, and they didn't have the money to pay the bill. And so what, what does Jesus say? Go fishing, Peter. Says, Peter's a fisherman. Peter says, and, and when you go fishing, you're going to pull up a fish. Bring me the coin. Bring me whatever you find in that fish. Now, how is Peter going to know? Have, have you any of you done the Lake, Lake Gregory Derbies up here? They just had another, I think it was $32,000 one or something like that. And if you find that exact fish and you hook that exact fish, I don't care how you hook it. You can hook it well or hook it in its tail. But as long as you bring it in and you find that exact fish, you're going to get thousands of dollars. It hasn't happened yet. They haven't found the exact fish. And yet, Peter went out, puts down his net, pulls the fish in, and out pops his coin and has just enough money to pay the taxes to Caesar. God invites us into God-sized God-sized assignments. Henry Blackaby said, when God lets you know what he wants to do through you, it will be something only God can do. What you believe about him will determine what you do. If you have faith in the God who called you, you will obey him. And he will bring to pass what he has purposed to do. If you lack faith, you will not do what he wants. And that is disobedience. Our text for this morning is 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 30. Yeah, Old Testament. 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. You'll find it right there. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 30. <laughs> you, don't you enjoy all these different names? The Moabites, the, the Ammonites. But, the, but look at the one we're going to see this morning. And the Meunites. The me unites. Now, I, I, I think there's something that, 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 that we're supposed to get, even just from that little thing. The me unites. The people that all surround you know, commit to, to me, and to themselves. And all. The me unites even are coming against Israel. Well, take a look. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the me unites came to make war on Jehosh Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazan, Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land? before your people Israel and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now... Here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? O oh, our God, will you not judge them 
For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Do you hear the prayer that, that Jehoshaphat is offering right there in front of the temple? He says, look, God told us that he, if he was going to put his name on this place, that if pestilent difficulty challenges came, that we could come to this place and we could pray and God would listen. God would hear us. And, and he says, that's what we're doing. We don't know how to handle this army. We don't have the resources. So God, help. God, what do you want us to do? And all the men of Judah, <clears throat> with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Folks, that's a verse we need to memorize. The battle is not ours but God's. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and heavenly places. But the battle is not ours, it's God's. The Lord is fighting for us. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Whatever you're facing, what's God want you to know? The Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Now we're at the crisis of belief. God has spoken. God said, I'm with you. I know this army is vast and it's great, but I'm going to fight for you. Trust me. The crisis of belief is right at this moment. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korathites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with very loud voice. Where's the worship team? Come on, come on. Noise, praise. Where is it? <clears throat> Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. And after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, this is a great way to go into, fight, into battle, right? So that's why we were down there last Sunday, to go down there and worship on that corner that we believe God wants us to have. To worship there before we even own it. To worship there as we're trying to follow and pursue the Lord. And what are they supposed to sing? Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. Notice, as they started praising God, not as they started fighting, but as they started praising God, the Lord set ambushes among the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir. They started fighting each other. To destroy and annihilate them. And after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. And on the fourth day, they were assembled in the valley of Barakah, where they praised the Lord. And this is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. 
Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. The fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. <clears throat> The prophecy was that not a single Jew would die, and none did. The prophecy was that God would fight for them, and God did. A God-sized opportunity that only God could meet. A vast army is coming against you. And the people, what did they do? Jehoshaphat says, it's time for us to pray. It's time for us to fast. It's time for us to get our focus on the Lord. Our God, will you not judge them, he prayed, for we have no power. We can't do this, God. No power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. When you're in the battle, when it's getting fierce and it's frightening and you're not sure what to do, that's when your eyes need to turn to God, he's saying. And then it goes on, verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Medaniah, a Levite, a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly and he started to prophesy. And he told them, the battle is not ours, for the battle belongs to the Lord. And we don't need to be afraid. We shouldn't be discouraged because God is going to go out and face the enemy for us tomorrow. And whatever battle you're facing, you don't need to be afraid because God's there with you. God's going to fight for you. And what did the people do when they heard that? They worshiped and praised God. Today we need to, we're at a crisis of belief. And we have to have faith in the Lord just like the people of Israel did and the people of Judah. We need to trust that God will deliver us. And how? We need to begin by prayer and then lead out with praise. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Did you also catch what, what, what happened near the end of the story? In verse 29, it says, The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. We need to let the world see that God is at work. I find it interesting that, that this article is out. And guess what? Did you read? How many of you saw this article? Some of you need to buy the paper, okay? <laughs> they're all over, they're around, all over town. You can even look at it on the internet, okay? But, but look at how it says... This is how it ends. One of the themes we're working with is community happens here. We want this to be a place where people can experience Crestline. This will be something good for our mountain community, Pastor Bill concluded. And then there's this paragraph. The Mountain News in next week's edition will include a fundraising thermometer to, check the, to track the church's ongoing effort to raise funds. We will be posting weekly community contributions as Crestline First Baptist Church moves toward achieving its down payment goal. That's the paper committing to track this, to, to log this, so that the mountain community can see what God's doing. That, that's what God said to Jehoshaphat. And said, look, if you will watch, if you will see what I will do, the nations are going to respond. One of the problems with our culture today is not enough of us Christians are letting the world around us see what God's doing for us. We're in that comfort zone. We're keeping it silent or we're doing it all on our own strength. We're fighting the battles by ourselves and instead, look, the paper's saying, watch out for us, Baptist. We're going to see what God's doing. We're going to let the community know what God's doing. And it's going to be fun. <laughs> and it ought to honor him. So let's see what God can do, folks. Some people use a phrase, God will never ask you to do something that you cannot do. 
thank you. You, you realize that it, the untruth there. But, but it's sad how many, and, and I've heard it. I've heard it right here. I've heard it from Christians. God won't ask me to do anything that I can't do. God won't ask me to do more than I can handle. That's baloney. <laughs> when God asks you to do something, you can't do it. When God asks you to do something, it's beyond what you can handle. It's a point where you've got to depend on his resources, not your own. Last Sunday, at the end of the vote, Roxanne came up to me. She's the, the general manager, I forget her exact title. She, she directs uh, the Family Service Agency of San Bernardino, San Bernardino County at Crestline, the one up in Top Town, which gives out weekly all kinds of food and helps all kinds of people. They do counseling and other services that they provide for people in need up there. And Roxanne runs that. Well, guess what? They, because of budget and challenges, everyone at Family Services Agency has had their time cut in half. Roxanne has moved from a full-time employee to now a part-time employee. And she came up here last week after the vote, and she hands me an envelope, and she says, Pastor Bill, and told, told me the story. My job's been cut in half. I'm not sure how I'm going to make it financially. But she said, before this happened, I was praying, and God gave me a number and said I had to give it to help buy the coffee house. She said, then I learned that I wasn't going to be working full time, that my pay has been cut. But she said, I still believe that God wants me to give this. And she said, handed me an envelope of cash in it. That, she's, that God told her to give. God challenges us to do, to do the impossible, and then he will help us do what he challenges us to do. The crisis of belief, I said it earlier, I want to remind you what Blackaby says. The crisis of belief, when we hear God telling us to take action, we're faced with a crisis. Are we going to believe God or not? An encounter with God will require faith. You're going to have to believe him you encounter God, God's challenge you. If, you, if, you're, if today is the day that you actually come to a point where you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept Jesus into my life, that's, a, that's an encounter with God. That's a crisis of belief. At that moment, you have to decide, am I going to act in faith or not? Because an encounter with God says, believe me, trust me, follow me. Secondly, an encounter with God, they're always God-sized. It takes more than you can handle. I don't know what you're battling. could be our neighbor who's dying of pancreatic cancer. could be an addiction. You're saying, I, I can't beat this. I've tried so many times. I've gone to so many treatments. I, I can't do it. could be something in your family. You know, oh, it's just too hard. And God's challenging you. Whatever, whatever you're going through right now, you say, Will you trust me with it? An encounter with God is always God's size. It's bigger than what you can do in yourself. Thirdly, what you do in response to God's invitation, that's really the critical point, reveals what you believe about God. What you do next tells what you believe about God. And lastly, lastly true faith requires action. What are you attempting to do for God? Think about it. What are you personally attempting to do for God that you can't do yourself? What do you need to do for God that is going to require faith beyond your own ability? Maybe we should begin by praying for more faith. Lord, I believe, the Father said to Jesus, but help my unbelief. Me today, we need to pray for more faith. And then, we need to commit to doing what God says. If God's telling you to do something, don't you think it would be wise to follow through? Do what God says. And just be aware. Your actions are revealing what you believe about God. See, this doesn't just commit the Mountain News. This commits Crestline First Baptist. 
this commits God. What are we going to do with what God's calling us to do? Let's pray. Lord, there's um, a lot in this the text, in this story with Jehoshaphat that I'm sure has m multitude of messages you want us to hear. From the importance of prayer when we are really struggling and afraid, when we see no way to, to victory, when we see only danger ahead, to the importance of praising you, giving thanks in all circumstances for this is the will, praising you even though the enemy is coming and danger surrounds us and difficulty is there and again we don't know how, to, how it's going to move forward to, to believing that you are going to fight for us. And then to following through because of that belief and going out onto the battlefield Still not knowing what's going to happen, but believing that you've said you will fight for us and you are going to bring the victory. God, there's just... And then for our community to be able to see, just like the, the, the nations saw in Israel what you did for them, God. Our community needs to see that, God, you're working. God, you're doing something bigger than a little church called Crestline First Baptist. You're doing something in people's lives, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help increase our faith and God, that you would give the courage, us the courage we need to obey what you're calling us to do. Lord, I, I pray that this would be so much bigger than just a, a corner piece of property and the, uh, the, the raising of some funds, but that this would be about a, a message, a lifestyle, um, a demonstration to our community that God lives, that Jesus Christ is here, that the Holy Spirit is at work, and that people can come to know him and experience his power in their lives. Lord, don't let us be comfortable with our own personal lifestyles or our own abilities, but God, help us to start living and acting on faith. Not stupid actions as some talk about, but, but true faith that believes in you and does what you call us to do. Oh God, increase our faith and today for anyone needs to commit their life to you or some challenge, some, some difficulty, Lord, I pray that they'll have the confidence just to put it in your hands. Lord, you know that there's people in this room that are facing uh, difficult times and they see no way out. Lord, show them that you are with them and you are the way out. In Jesus' name. Your worship bulletin has a tear off, and I'd like to invite everybody. Would you just go ahead? Just do this for me. Pull out your bulletin, please. Everybody, pull out your bulletin. Tear off the tear off. Some of you need to get bulletins. <laughs> tear off the tear off. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> tear off the tear off. And take a step of faith today. On that tear-off, write down whatever battle is you're facing, whatever crisis, whatever challenge. Write down a commitment to give something to God. If it's an addiction, if it's about a family matter, if it's about health issue, I want you to put it as a, an act of faith. God, I'm giving this to you. I believe you fight for me. I don't know what you're going to do, but here it is. I'm making this commitment to you. R write it down there and, and let us join you in believing God for you and for whatever that is. Share it with him on the tariff. Put it then as your offering today. I know we have to raise $220,000, but, but you know what? This offering is more important than the money. An offering that says, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to believe you for this. I'm, I'm giving this to you. Give it to him as an offering.